Encoders and decoders, in a practical sense, are the same thing. They have inputs and they have outputs, and there's a mapping from input to output. So for certain inputs, you get certain outputs every single time. It's combinational logic which means ones and zeros, highs and lows, and the output is always the same for the same input no matter what. There's no state involved, there's no memory, it's just input to output. Now conceptually, the idea is that you have some data, and there's a decoded form and an encoded form. And what that means depends on the situation. You might have a decoded form in regular binary and an encoded form in binary coded decimal, or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just inputs to outputs. And the operation is going to be reversible, almost always. When you're dealing with an IC, it's going to be. If you're dealing with fancy encryption, not so much. But if you have an equivalent encoder and decoder chip and you wire them cross, then they're just going to switch between the encoded and decoded form always. So an encoder and a decoder chip is going to have a certain number of inputs and a certain number of outputs. Let's say we have two inputs and two outputs. So just binary, think of it as a binary number. Low, 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 high, high, low, high, high, and then whatever. So it's just for every combination of inputs, you'll have outputs. And depending on what the chip is doing, the output could be high, or low, or high impedance. Because some of these devices are not just meant to translate data between forms. If you're translating data, you'll have high and low input and high and low output. But sometimes they're being used to drive devices. And in that case, you could have, you know, ignored input. So instead of this, you could say low, 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 high, or high whatever, depending on your application. Let me show you some examples. Let's start with decoders because they're easier. One simple decoder is a binary decoder. Let's say your input, you have input zero and input one. So your input is a binary number. So it would be highs and lows, high is one, low is zero. So just for clarity, I'll write them as zero and one. It's the same thing. And now let's say you have four outputs. Output zero, one, two, and three. So let's say this is a device select. Let's say you are driving some sort of multiplexer or a data bus, a tri-state data bus, and you're trying to use two microcontroller pins to control four devices. So zero, zero in binary is zero. So output zero might be a one. Output one, two, or three, you might be selecting which of these to activate. And you could have high impedance for the ones you're not using, or you could have low, in this case zero, whichever you need, however the chip is built. And so you could have these outputs driving the pins on the tri-state bus or whatever you're driving, and it would activate one at a time, but using only two microcontroller pins. So that's all a binary decoder does. It takes a compact binary form and splits it out in some way that's useful in your application. So you save your microcontroller pins because a decoder chip is going to be very cheap and not take up a ton of space on the board. Another type of decoder would be a display decoder. Let's say that your input is binary coded decimal. So you would have four inputs and in binary coded decimal you could do let's say zero through nine and you could also do let's say 10 but this would be decimal point so 0 through 9 are the only valid values as digits 0 through 9 digit because binary code a decimal but you have leftovers you have six digits left over in binary code a decimal that aren't doing anything so you could use one to say oh draw the decimal point for your display you know you've got your your seven segment display and it's eight segment because it's also got a decimal point and these are just leds so what you do is your outputs would be eight pins so o o to o seven and you would have a common cathode probably display so you know zero would be like so and one would be like so and nine would be like so so the outputs would just be whatever pins whatever segment should be on or off based on how we would write this number and then you'd look at your spec sheet for the display and for the decoder and just put the right wire to the right led anode tie all the cathodes to ground with your little resistors in there and so you have once again four microcontroller pins or more likely a four bit register that has had its value set by the microcontroller and then stays that way so the microcontroller sets the register's memory and then goes and does something else and the memory just stays there while some other calculation is happening and your your four bit register gets translated to eight LEDs and all of the logic is done by the 
integrated circuit. And again, it's super cheap because you don't need a microcontroller with variable logic and memory. There's no memory in this decoder. It's just hardwired. So you just have, you, you create a tooth table when you're making this IC. You create a tooth table and say, these inputs, these outputs. And then you have a computer program that figures out the best layout of transistors, prints it out, and then you've got a super cheap little fixed integrated circuit that you can make a million of because you're going to have the same kind of chip used by everybody who makes a calculator, you know, in the good old days. And so it ends up being incredibly inexpensive. If you're being crafty, you could even put four flip-flops in and have it store the binary coded decimal itself, you know, basically a built-in 4-bit register. That would be neat. Or you could just have the register separate. So that's what a decoder does. A decoder takes some input, whatever it is, and translates it, combinatorically I think is the word, into some other form that's useful. And the point of it is it would be expensive time, energy, board space, whatever, to have it that way in the first place, you can decode it live much cheaper. So what about an encoder? Let's just talk about a binary encoder. So in this case, we're taking our whichever device is active on the bus, and we want to get that into a binary number because the microcontroller wants to input it. The microcontroller wants to use fewer pins to read which device is trying to talk to it. So you'd have inputs for four devices. So you could have, let's say, high for which device is on and low otherwise. And then your output would be the two microcontroller pins and you would get a binary number, 0, 1, 2, or 3, on those two pins telling it which one of these is sending a high signal. So it's just the opposite operation. However, you might notice something. Why can't we do this? Right? Because you've got four inputs. That's a total of 16 different possibilities, and we're only using four here. Here's a fifth. What does that give you? It doesn't give you anything. So this is why you have something called a priority binary encoder. So instead of low, we don't have low as the input. We have ignored. In this case, device zero is the highest priority. When device zero is high, we ignore everything. When device zero is not high, but device one is high, we ignore everything else. So in this case, we guarantee that we're only looking at the one that's high. We, we search from highest priority to lowest priority until we get to the first high value, and then we ignore everything else. So the real world equivalent you might have, let's say your four devices are a keyboard, a serial port, a timer chip, a clock, and a hard drive. So you might decide that the keyboard is the highest priority because you always want the user to be able to interrupt whatever's going on by pressing escape or control alt delete or something. And then you want the timer chip to be the second priority. And you might want timer chip to be the first priority over the keyboard, but let's say you want timer to be the second priority. So whenever the user is not typing anything, it's keeping its clock active. And then you have the hard drive as the third priority and the serial port is the fourth priority. So if the hard drive wants attention, the serial port has to wait. So if that's how we set up our priorities, then that's what the binary encoder, the priority binary encoder does. If you're familiar with the acronym IRQ, interrupt request, back in the good old DOS days, and it, I mean, it's still used now, but no high-level programmer will ever see that stuff. That's, that's the kind of thing you see when you're developing device drivers and operating systems. But it's basically what it is. It's a priority binary encoder which comes out with an IRQ number that goes into a certain part of memory in the operating system and runs code, and then the highest priority thing that did it at the same time, that's the IRQ that runs. And if a higher priority IRQ comes in while that one's running, then the higher priority one interrupts the lower one. So, you know, the most important things always get to run. And that's encoders and decoders. It's just inputs to outputs. The inputs can be high, low, or sometimes ignored. The outputs can be high, low, or sometimes times high impedance. For the most common operations like seven and eight segment displays and binary and encoders and decoders, you'll just be able to buy a chip off a mouser. For everything else, you can always roll your own. If you really, really want a circuit that does whatever binary encoding and decoding you want, you can program it on an FPGA or hook up some transistors if you're really feeling frisky. Whatever your little heart desires. So while you ponder that, I'll be seeing you.